I was really excited about meeting you all because part of my passion is trying to improve outcomes for uh, women and um, families where the pregnancy, be, pregnancy has been affected by diabetes and pregnancy. And throughout all the studies that we've done, really, um, we're not going to make any meaningful shift without secondary care building better bridges with primary care and the community. So hopefully that comes through. If you're interested in this area, my email address is there. Please uh, contact me and I'd love to meet you and have a chat. So um, when we talk about diabetes and pregnancy, we talk about pre-pregnancy um, diabetes, so type 1 and type 2, and most of these we'll know about beforehand, but occasionally we pick them up on the HbA1c screening um, at booking. And then we have our gestational diabetics, those are the um, diabetics that we first recognise in pregnancy, usually with the OGTT at 24 to 28 weeks, um, and that resolves following pregnancy. And then we have our sort of awkward teenagers, which are the pre-diabetics, who are also picked up at um, screening, but we don't really know what to do with yet, and I'll talk a little bit about them at the end. So this is 2019 data from um, Counties Manukau, and you can see here that of our 7,000 births a year, approximately one in eight um, people are birthing with a diagnosis of gestational diabetes. And this is a massive increase. In 2006, it was 3%. So, um, you know, we're seeing rates rise, and we're seeing them rise internationally. Um, so this is an incredible burden. So in addition to these women, our service will see about 120 to 150 type 2 diabetics and type um, 1 diabetics, about 20 of those every year. Diabetes is associated with poorer pregnancy outcomes and there's a dose-dependent relationship between the glucose levels and all of these things. So for pre-pregnancy diabetics, they'll have difficulty, more difficulty conceiving, there's greater chance of having a baby that's affected by a congenital malformation. Uh, miscarriage rates are higher, rates of IUGR are also higher. For gestational and pre-existing diabetics, they've got increased rates of preterm birth, uh, NICU admission, and pregnancy-associated costs are about 50% higher due to um, the increased burden of NICU admission. The um, babies have increased adipose deposition, it makes them larger, they're more difficult to birth, and this can result in trauma to both the mother and the baby. They increase stillbirth rates, and as these babies grow up, as children, they're more likely to be insulin resistant and have increased adiposity. So as they enter reproductive age, they are also more likely themselves to develop diabetes and diabetes in pregnancy. Uh, the mothers are more likely to have hypertensive disorders and caesarean birth, and also the physical and psychological impacts of everything which has happened to their um, baby. So pregnancy is also associated with a progression of um, diabetic complications. Um, for type 1 diabetics, they're more likely to have hypoglycemia and hypoglycemic unawareness. They're also um, more likely to develop DKA in pregnancy. Diabetic retinopathy can progress, and this is most likely in those with existing higher-grade non-proliferative diabetic retinopathy. Those who undergo rapid glycemic improvement in the first trimester, so this is really important to have these people well-controlled with target um, glucose levels pre-pregnancy, uh, and those with existing hypertension. Uh, Kidney disease can also progress towards end-stage renal disease uh, requiring dialysis, and this might be irreversible. So the people most at risk are those who have pre-existing chronic diabetic kidney disease, severe hypertension, nephrotic range proteinuria, and pre-existing cardiovascular disease. So this group of people is also at the highest uh, risk of preterm birth, preeclampsia, and fetal growth restriction. The best pregnancy care begins before pregnancy, uh, and I just can't emphasise enough the importance of entering pregnancy um, with good glycemic control. Um, all of these recommendations come from a uh, great paper that's free access uh, in the ANS Drug magazine, and it's Australasian Diabetes and Pregnancy Society 2020 guidelines. So fundamentally, recognising that everyone with diabetes, well, not everyone, but um, is a potential pregnant person, uh, and talking to them about the risks and the need for good glycemic control. And both NICE and ADIPS recommend that HbA1c should be performed between every one and three months with a target range, uh, target of less than 48 before you become pregnant. 
for type 1 diabetics, that might be tricky um, due to the risk of recurrent hypos. So a slightly um, looser target of less than 53 for them is acceptable. And you know that mean gestation at booking for our type 2s is eight weeks. So then if you see them, in, if we see them in clinic nine, 10 weeks to you know, start ramping up their meds, the major organ development's already been done. You know, placentation is well underway. So I just don't think we're going to see the shifts in um, the outcomes unless we really manage this pre-pregnancy. Uh, folic acid should be given at the higher dose of five milligrams from three months preconception and the standard dose of iodine um, through pregnancy and breastfeeding. So we looked at the rates of um, HbA1 screening pre-pregnancy for our type 2 diabetics over a calendar year and the levels of HbA1c at booking. Uh, and only one in three women had had a HbA1c done um, three months prior to conception. Uh, the median HbA1c was 65, so well above target. And this was no different if people had had um, a scre screening HbA1c preconception or just at booking, suggesting it's just it's being done opportunistically but not being used to sort of drive up the medications and obtain better glycemic control. Um, and this is a slightly more complicated um, diagram here. So you can see that dotted line, do I have a mouse, along here, that's uh, um, the target level of HbA1c of 48, and then we've got the different ethnic groups um, broken down along the bottom with a blue dot of preconception HbA1c. The main take home here is like, everything's above that line, and in fact we had more people, or as many people who had double the target level of HbA1c at pregnancy entry as we did people who were meeting the target, so we need to do something better here. Um, other things, review the medications, continue Lantus, Protophane, short-acting insulins and metformin. Um, ideally, we don't want people to be on statins and ACE inhibitors in pregnancy, so stopping when you're actively trying to conceive or early in pregnancy. And please, if you're unsure, just call for advice. It's a lot easier. We're really friendly and nice, and we prefer to give you advice rather than try and convince someone to restart a medication, which is important, but they've been told is potentially harmful for their pregnancy. Um, give advice on diet, physical activity, self-monitoring and targets, uh, baseline testing in addition to all the normal booking stuff, uh, lipids uh, for type 1s, TSH, um, thyroid peroxidase, autoantibodies, uh, B12, particularly for vegans, vegetarians, people on long-term metformin um, and creatinine and albumin creatinine um, ratio in the urine. Screen for comorbidities, optimises and refer. That's a lot to do. Um, and there's more detail in the paper. As soon as pregnancy is confirmed, we are happy to accept a referral. Um, we recommend self-monitoring five times a day, blood sugar testing and targets of fasting less than 5.4, postprandial 6.7. If someone's on insulin, they should have weekly um, CBG reviews and up titration of the insulin. And normally we would be able to see someone within one to two um, weeks of referral. Advice on sick day, nausea management, ketone testing for the type 1 diabetics, aspirin and calcium from 12 weeks with a confirmed intrauterine pregnancy to reduce preeclampsia risk, and complete the baseline testing that I had on the previous slide if that hasn't been done. What does our clinic look like? So this is pretty county specific, but there'll be some variation of this across New Zealand. So we have diabetes and pregnancy superstar specialty midwives, and they um, making contact with patients often more than once a week, titrating up their medication in consultation with the endocrinologist. At the physical clinic, um, people have one-to-one -one dietitian input, retinal screening every trimester. They see an OBS and a physician each appointment, which is usually every four weeks. Serial growth scans from 28 weeks. And then at 36 weeks, uh, we discuss the timing and mode of birth. And this is based on the size of the baby, the glycemic control, and the appearance of other comorbidities. So type 1 and type 2 diabetics, usually there is a planned early birth um, there. So gestational diabetes, these are people who have um, got through with a booking HbA1c that was normal um, or um, below 50. So if they're pre-diabetic, they would go straight to an OGTT at 24 to 28 weeks. If they were um, below 40, they would have a polycose and then an OGTT if that was positive. So you get a diagnosis of diabetes if your fasting is 5.5 or 2 hour 9. 
Uh, the clinic looks similar to the pre-existing diabetics um, experience, except we have a group session uh, with general dietary advice and education for the um, gestational diabetics. They have their own diabetes and pregnancy midwife, they self-monitor and targets are the same. They see an obstetrician only unless they're on insulin and then they'll see a physician as well. Um, we do the growth scans and have the timing of birth discussion. And most of these people will still have their own um, midwife as well. So, um, cool. so postpartum, this is a higher risk group of people. 30% chance of future GDM, 50% chance of type 2 diabetes within 10 years, twofold uh, risk of cardiovascular disease compared to people without gestational diabetes, and this is irrespective of if they develop type 2 or not. Uh, offspring have fivefold greater risk of developing impaired glucose tolerance and um, this is not just due to the family situation because their siblings who were not um, born to diabetic and um, gestational diabetic mothers don't have that same risk. So what a great opportunity to promote health behaviours and improve long-term outcomes. Um, this is just some results from a study that we did looking at people's experience in diabetes and pregnancy in our service and we found postnatal was a major gap. So um, this is a quote from someone which is illustrative of many, many experiences. After I had the baby, I was like, what do I do? Do I still take the insulin? Do I throw it? No one made any contact with me about it again. I ended up binning it. I was like, am I still diabetic? I don't understand. Because your lifestyle changes when you have diabetes, it's kind of like the baby's out and you're done. So I think we pour a lot of resources in um, to the pregnancy thing, but on either side of it, um, we need to find better ways of supporting people. Okay, I'm just going to whiz through this. So pre-diabetes, it's when you not quite um, don't meet the threshold for diabetes at um, your screening HbA1c, and um, we've looked at the outcomes of these people uh, in looking at over 10,000 pregnancies over two years, and we've found that they have an increased risk. So what we um, see here, I'll just draw your attention to that, these people have a 1 in 30 chance of losing their baby after 20 weeks and all of these losses happen before they would have normally had their OGTT. So they shouldn't be normalised, the care needs to be individualised um, and we need clinical trials to tell us best what to do. Every hospital in New Zealand treats these people slightly differently. Um, the main thing is that they are high risk and that's it. That's um, diabetes and pregnancy. <laughs> Thank you.